What is your perfect college football playoff format? We got a question from one of y'all on my Twitter page, and I feel like it's about time we start bringing some solutions to the table. Because we have this microphone here, and we get to voice our objections to things that we disagree with in the college football world. But let's be people of action. Let's be people of substance. Let's be people that we, uh, when we see a problem, we look for an answer. Welcome into the hard game. It's March 7th, third day, March 7th. 2024 last one on the face of the planet so glad to have y'all in here man we got Tennessee head coach Josh Heupel joining the show here in just a matter of moments talk to coach Heupel about everything from his new quarterback with Nico Iamaliava about to run the show and also how they adapted with Joe Milton running the show because remember now that 2022 offense man they went NASCAR fast they scored 40 points a game they were throwing the ball downfield that offense last year with Joe Milton they were good they still scored over 30 a game but you could tell there was an adaptation that happened. How did they do that? What are they going to adapt to this year with Nico running the show? Really, really uh, transparent conversation with Coach Heupel. We appreciated all his time. Excited for y'all to see that one. Speaking of offenses, man, who are the most dangerous offenses in 2024? Got a list for you there. Tennessee is on that list. A couple things that have to happen for them to take some jumps in 2024, but Texas is on there. I don't want to give away the whole list, but there's a, a lot of teams that, are poised to score a whole lot of points this upcoming season. And we've seen now in college football, man, that is becoming more and more of a non-negotiable to score at a high clip. Like it used to be, you could sort of scheme your way into being a ground and pound and being game control. Like now you have to score 40. Period, might drop the end. You have to score in the 40 at least once or twice a season to be able to win it all. So we'll talk about those teams. Uh, Texas, got a question from y'all about Texas recruiting and what Steve Sarkeesian's done there. He's done a phenomenal job, so we'll sort of talk about what he's done there first, then kind of take a look to the future and why the way that he's recruited at Texas is different than previous staffs. Also, development plays a big factor there. Another question from you all about the sleeping giants in college football. Who are those teams that, if they wake up now, could wreak havoc on the rest of the landscape? And as I mentioned at the top of this whole thing, one of you asked us, what is the perfect college football playoff model? Well, I don't want to toot our own horn, but I, th I, think, we, I think we found it. I think we found ourselves a pretty good happy medium. Hey, make sure you're subscribed. We're glad to have y'all here. Whatever you got going on, we say this at the, at the beginning of every single show because it's important, whether it's work, whether it's school, whatever you got that's, that's kind of pressing on the mental a little bit, let's relax. We're talking ball for the next hour or so, mental vacation time. Let's get right to it. Went on a podcast yesterday, and I thought they posed a, a really intriguing question. I think it's the Behind the You podcast. They do a great job out there with uh, the University of Miami. The question was, so what's next for college football? Because we got so many things changing and we have all these storylines around NIL and around conference realignment and all these things that are moving right now. What's next for college football? Where do you see college football in the next three years? I thought it was a great question. So we're going to kind of take the bat out here and take a few swings at this thing. The first thing that I think is going to happen, and this might be in the next year or so, I don't have any insight to this. There's a lot of people like Pete Nakos that are more well-versed on this whole thing legally. I think we're headed towards more structure in NIL. And the whole injunction being granted with Tennessee and Virginia, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Everybody understands that. The NCAA is no longer going to be able to oversee the way that NIL operates. And so what that means, I believe, is you're going to have more people get in the room that have a better background to handle NIL. And so when I say more structured, I'm talking like uniform contracts. Heck, we might in the next few years, in my opinion, arrive at a place where we're getting kids signing on signing day, and then we find out what they signed for from a monetary standpoint. I don't think that's too crazy because when it comes to all this money changing hands, and we've said this for a while now, more structure, more transparency for both sides, that's a good thing. Like paperwork kind of gets a bad rap, contracts kind of get a bad rap because it's like, oh, you don't know what you're signing. Well, if you do know what you're signing, it benefits everybody involved. You know the service you have to provide, and your person who's handing that contract over to you is able to protect themselves as well. So I think it's a good thing. I think we're headed towards that. There's, again, too much money changing hands for this to not be a reality, for us to not have both sides protected by more structure in that world. So I think that's a good thing, and NIL overall, I believe, is a good thing because we talk about Johnny Menzel, which is a phenomenal example of this whole thing, he went on a podcast and talked about how he was getting a stipend for 700 bucks while his jersey is selling out of the a and bookstore for like, I think that sold like $42 million was his estimation of, of uh, revenue with what Johnny Menzel jerseys were going for. So yeah, benefiting the athletes at this point in college football and college sports is a great thing. Structure, I believe, 
is headed this way. Now, in terms of structure, we talk about you know, the NIL space, the conference realignment space, that's continuing to evolve. We're going to call our shot a little bit here. I think the ACC will look drastically different if not cease to exist in the next three years. Now, if you're an ACC team right now, you probably just gasped and said, whoa, 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 you're down on the ACC? I'm not down on the ACC. I don't think those teams cease to exist. I think there's a lot of big brands and big teams in that conference that would land on their feet. But the problem with the ACC right now is in, in regards to running a restaurant, who's the one person you want to make sure stays happy in that entire building? The chef. Why? Because they are providing a lot of the product that provides the revenue, right? Well, the chef right now in the ACC is Florida State. And it has been very, very public. They are not happy in the ACC. And so as long as Florida State's not happy, there's going to be an effort to get out of there. And I think it's only a matter of time before push comes to shove and Florida State gets out. And when Florida State gets out of the ACC, they're not going alone. (laughs) We've seen this in the college football realignment world, like, Very rarely does a team leave singularly. So when they leave, who else is going with them? Probably another big brand. Probably a Clemson. Probably a Miami. And so what this would would eventually amount to, in my opinion, is you would see these people start to, I say these people, I'm still speaking in the restaurant metaphor, you see these different teams start to scatter, and they would find, again, I think a lot of these places, a lot of these teams would find a conference to land with, whether it be a North Carolina or a Virginia or Virginia Tech. They'd have a fair amount of suitors, I have to believe. But what would happen then is kind of the second round of what happened to the Pac-12. Musical chair starts, find your spot. If you don't find your spot, that's tough. But I think this even further accelerates the Super League that's going to happen. Cole Kublik, Andy Staples, they chopped it up on Andy's show, I believe it was this past week talking about the future, you know, SEC, Big Ten, two just mega conferences with however many double-digit teams are in both of those conferences. I'm talking double digits like 30-plus teams in each conference. And uh, I think we're, in the next three years, I wouldn't be wildly surprised if that ended up being the case. Again, I don't know. I don't have any prediction here or any insight, but that's my, my feel on this whole thing. Last thing, and this is just something that makes way too much sense. We've seen this for a long time now. A commissioner is just the the next step in college football. We have to get a college football commissioner. Why? Because, again, it's too obvious when it comes to the balance of power. The SEC and the Big Ten, they hold all the cards at the table and more power to them. But the people in charge of the SEC and the Big Ten, Tony Petiti of the Big Ten and Greg Sankey with the SEC, they're acting in the best interest of their employer. That's what they're supposed to do. And so what I would hope happens here in the near future is we get a college football commissioner whose obligation is to the well-being of college football. Now, with that being said, I think the way this would happen is the same way that most big things have happened in the college football world the last couple of seasons. Starts with a little bit of rumble. Starts with some support from the college football public, and not just us as fans, but also some folks like, you know, a a very visible figure, whether it be a Paul Feinbaum, a Kirk Herbstreit, a a Joel Klatt, like someone like that starting to support that publicly. And then we'd get some radio silence. It'd get some traction. It'd be a talking point. We'd talk about it on this show, and then it would die down. And out of nowhere, pop, report comes out, hey, so-and-so is being considered to take this position or they're going to create this position, the college football commissioner, effectively, and, and that would be how that happens. So head on a swivel. I think that's kind of the life cycle that would take on. Some folks would, would hear this and say, well, J.D., isn't that sort of the, the nail in the coffin for traditional college football? I don't think it has to be as long as we hire the right person. And I say we, I don't know who we is, but as long as the right person gets that position of power and understands what's made college football, college football, the regular season being special, campuses being special, marching bands. I mean, the the overall tradition of college football, the pageantry, someone who gets that and can preserve that as best as possible, we would be okay. The right person driving the ship would put us in a good place. But again, like college football as a whole, hurtling towards a professional model. We all see that. We're paying players now. There is a lot going on with the college football playoff format resembling a professional model. Professional sports have commissioners. I'm not lobbying for college football to be a professional sport. In fact, I've been on the opposite side of that fence for the entirety of this conversation. But if we're going to go down this road, we got to have someone in charge of the overall entity with the best interests of that entity. So that's where we're headed in college football, in my opinion. Again, I'm not, I'm not Pete Nakos here with the legal background that he has, but 
the way that we're looking at this thing, structuring NIL, the ACC is going to look different with Florida State, Miami, and Clemson probably finding new homes. And a commissioner, again, makes too much sense. Balance of power and hopefully preserving what we love about college football. Now, also what we love about college football, man, is the coaches that make it up. And we've been very fortunate to have a lot of those phenomenal coaches across the sport join us. We sat down with Tennessee head coach Josh Heupel and just had a great conversation, man. Talked everything from his quarterback, talked everything to radio communication in the helmets, talked about his ability to recruit and develop quarterbacks, talked about the secondary they're going to have this year with a lot of new faces in there. So uh, that's enough of a, of a preview for you. But without further ado, here is the head ball coach of Tennessee, Josh Heupel. Joining us now, the head football coach for Tennessee, Coach Josh Heupel. And Coach, I got to start here. Last time we talked, you told us, hey, I am undefeated when it comes to the crossbar challenge, a perfect one or no. I got to ask, are you, are you still holding the belt? Are we still the undisputed heavyweight champ? I am uh, the undisputed champ at this point, still uh, undefeated. Uh, it could be because I haven't given those guys a, another shot at the, uh, at the title at this point yet, too. Hey, that goose egg in the loss column. That, that, that's all the same. That's, that, that is the, the end all. That is, that is the final judge right there, the, the undefeated column uh, over there. But, Coach, i got to ask you this here. It's been a, a wild last couple of weeks. Uh, was there any conversation with, with your football team when there was all these things going on with the NCAA and all these extracurriculars that had nothing to do with ball in itself? Yeah, I'm real quick, touched on in team meeting, uh, realistically, probably for, uh, for less than, than a minute. And, and uh you know, moved on. All of our preparation, our focus uh, has been on uh, getting ready for, for spring ball here. We just finished up, or we'll finish up uh, here on Friday, the, uh, the end of our first quarter, our, our off-season work. Guys have been fantastic, and, uh, you know, these guys uh, are focused on, on what matters. And, you know, we have great leadership here at the University of Tennessee, uh, Chancellor Palman, uh, Athletic Director Danny White, and, and uh, got great trust in them. And Coach, from last year to this year, it felt like you guys really adapted to, to your personnel going from Henry Hooker to Joe Milton and just all the different pieces you had defensively. What went into that and how did you go about approaching that adaptation in 2023? Yeah, this time of year uh, begins that process. Uh, you have an understanding of who left your building, who's in the building. Uh, you try to forecast the things that you're going to need to be successful uh, in situational football in particular uh, in all three phases of the game. Uh, you try to adapt and change uh, based off of the personnel that you have in the building, some schemes that you want to introduce. Uh, you're also going to go through that process throughout the course of spring ball and, and uh, training camp before you make final decisions. But uh, you're trying to, uh, to continually evolve in everything that you're doing. And you also told us last time we got a chance to talk to you, hey, the, the little things for us, those make up the big things on the field. What are those little things that you're really harping on right now with your football team? Well, really, it's just your, your, your daily life and, and your accountability to, to doing the things that you need to at a, at a really high level and competing really hard in, in everything that you do. Great competitors don't compartmentalize it. Uh, they're fierce competitors in everything that they're doing. Uh, you rewind that into this uh, stage of the year, uh, what we've been doing in the weight room, uh, changing bodies, gaining strength, uh, adding speed and athleticism and ability to bend to, to our frames individually, collectively making us uh, more athletic and, and a stronger uh, football team. Uh, our guys have been great here during, you know, our weeks of, of preparation here uh, before we get into spring ball. And, uh, you know, you just uh, continually track those things and uh, make sure that uh, your players understand that uh, the importance of those things and, and how that parlays itself into playing the way that we need to each play when we ultimately get on the field next fall. Coach, you played quarterback at a really high level. You've recruited some really high-level quarterbacks. You've had high-level quarterbacks in your building. What goes into speaking quarterback so fluently for you? Well, uh, it does start with, you know, just, you know, me playing the position, understanding what it looks like, feels like uh, inside of the pocket, uh, what's going on with all the bodies moving around you, uh, how to best, uh, best teach those guys. Uh, as they grow during the off season uh, to put themselves in the best position to be the, their best when you get to the to the field, uh, understanding the ebbs and flows during the course of a practice, a game, uh, how you communicate with them to to be their best, and then you know our offensive staff uh, doing a great job of taking the player. What can he do his best? Uh, what are his strengths? Continuing to prove upon the areas that we need him to grow in, uh, but ultimately putting those guys in a position to be successful when we get to the fall. 
you've worked the scout team a little bit. You ever go out there and say, all right, hey, we're not getting the look we need. Let me loosen up the wing a little bit here. Nah, you know, I don't, uh, don't want to dice up. them. Don't want to dice them up, man. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't. I'm not sure I can get it past 15 at this point, but uh, underneath, uh, I'd be able to dice them up. Hey, all about ball placement. From what I, I mean, from what I'm told, having never played, well, that was my. Hey, that was my only strength as a player too. That that, that hasn't just come as I, I've gotten older. Well, your quarterback this year, Nico Iamaliava, obviously has a, a ton of physical strengths. Uh, what does he bring to this offense? Speaking about you know adaptability, what do you think will change about this offense with uh, with eight running the show? Yeah, we'll continue to evolve uh, with Nico and try to put him in a position to be his best. Uh, really excited to get on the grass with him uh, this spring. Uh, he had most of bowl prep where uh, where he was the guy as he prepared uh, for the, the Citrus Bowl. Um, I've loved from the day that he got here, uh, just, you know, his focus in trying to grow and become his best. Uh, fundamentally, continuing to grow uh, balance and, and footwork inside of the pocket, which leads to, you know, accuracy. His continued growth and understanding defensive IDs, recognition, you know, pre-snap reads, post-snap rotations. Um, you know, he's uh, very gifted as far as an arm talent, um, continuing to become more accurate because of the, the skill sets that I just talked about inside of the pocket. Uh, as a young player, he's hyper-focused on him growing as a player and becoming his best. He's going to have to continue to, to grow into a leadership role when you're playing that position. Um, you know, that's ex extremely important. Yeah, Coach, you mentioned it, like the, the position itself being the quarterback at Tennessee and then also all of the high-profile accolades that came with him out of high school. Do you all have any conversations when it comes to managing pressure and expectations and all that outside noise that inevitably comes with being Nico Iamaliava? Yeah, that, that's been a part of his life for, for a really long time. Uh, the recruiting process started early. Um, you know, he's had a lot of attention on him throughout that process. And then certainly once he's gotten here, too, uh, there's high expectations outside of the building. I think it's important for me, our staff, our players, everybody, and certainly Nico, too, um, that uh, you stay uh, focused on your expectations. And then you go work extremely hard to, to put yourself in a position to be your best. Um, he's very calm. Uh, he never gets too high, too low. Uh, he's got a great work ethic inside of the building. He's extremely consistent in that. Because of that, his talent, um, you know, his impact on his teammates, um, you know, our players have a great trust and belief in him as a player. Um, and as I talked about earlier, as he continues to grow in that leadership role, uh, I do believe he's going to be somebody that uh, those guys rally around. And uh, really just excited to see his continued growth here as we go through this offseason uh, kickoff. It's not too far away, but at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity for growth. Uh, if he continues to attack every single day the way that he has during this uh, beginning part of our offseason, uh, we'll be really excited about uh, getting on the field with him. I mean, Coach, everybody wants to talk about Hennon Hooker in that 2022 offense, and he obviously deserves a, a ton of credit. But that wide receiver room for him was elite. I mean, from Jalen Hyatt to Cedric, Hump, to Cedric Timmel when he was healthy. When you look at this receiver room for what your offense has in 2024, what do you make of them right now? What's your expectation level for those guys? Yeah, absolutely. Make sure you throw Brew McCoy in that uh, that group right yeah, there yeah. too. No, no uh, doubt. Excited to get Brew uh, back healthy here as we uh, as we go through the off season and in into training camp. Um, you know, extremely mature, tough, physical, consistent player. Um, you know, the growth of our wide receiver room will be important uh, when you have a young quarterback. The ten other guys around him, and this is always true, but it's true when you got a, a young. Uh, quarterback. It's going to be really important that those guys play at a consistent high level uh, so that he can operate and, and go uh, be efficient and effective and be his best too. And, um, you know, that wide receiver room, Squirrel White, uh, his continued growth. We got some young players that just got here uh, in bowl preparation, uh, two signees and, and Mike and Braylon. Excited to see them out on the grass here as we get into to spring ball. And, um, you know, just the constant growth. Uh, that room, you know, as we've built our, our roster here over the last couple of years, uh, it's the deepest that we've been at that wide receiver room, which provides great competition, driving them every, every single day in, in whatever phase of the offseason we're in. Um, but it's also, uh, I believe, going to give us an opportunity to play more bodies than we've been able to here uh, the first couple of years. And I'm sure some good battles for that defense during the day. I mean, there's a lot of new faces in that secondary coach. What have you made of what they've done so far during winter conditioning and then your expectations for them when it comes to spring football? Yeah, absolutely. A young group um, that's got to grow up quickly, like what they've done here so far in the offseason. Uh, the most athletic fluid movement patterns, um, size, 
and when I say size, length and speed, uh, the combination that we've had uh, in our secondary. And, you know, our defense has continued to take steps here over our, our first three years here, got great leadership in Tim Banks and our, our defensive staff. Uh, really looking forward to the continued growth uh, on that, uh, that third level. Uh, looking forward to a, a lot of competition there this spring. Um, and uh, for us as a program, our depth at wide receiver, um, you know, the depth that we have uh, at defensive back, it'll be uh, the first time that we've been able to have great competition consistently out on the practice field, which I think is going to help us grow and be prepared to be our best in the fall. Coach, the new rules in college football that I believe are, if they're not finalized right now, maybe they will be by the time this comes out, the, uh, the radios and the helmets. For an offense like y'all that go as fast as you do, the reviews from Texas Tech from them using them in the bowl game was, hey, the quarterback, they don't have to look at the sideline. They can just keep their eyes on the defense. They can go quicker. Are y'all going to be even, even faster offensively with this new technology, or how do you plan to utilize the new radios and the helmets for Tennessee? Yeah, that's something that, you know, I think we're going to experiment here uh, through the course of spring and, and uh, find out how to best operate and function within that, uh, the communication directly to the quarterback, um, your skilled players being able to, uh, to communicate, get lined up quickly. Uh, at the end of the day, we always want to play as efficiently. It's not necessarily a set target of when we want to snap the ball. It's making sure that we're operating as efficiently as we can between plays uh, as we're in our tempo to apply pressure to uh, to defense. Um, having worn that uh, previously when you know I was a player in in, uh, in the league for uh, for my cup of coffee, um, you know. I, I didn't want the guy talking to me too much before the snap of the ball. So each quarterback, I think, has an opportunity to be a little bit different and, and finding out what's best for them in that process before before the snap. Okay, because I'm thinking like, all right, coach, I'm all out of eligibility, but I probably – I could maybe muster up somewhere in like a 4 nine forty, and you scheme guys open all the time. I'm like, can you, can you scheme me open for one play? We'll find a way to create enough space for you to have a catch and run opportunity out there on the perimeter. Golly, that fires me up. Well, Coach, we appreciate all your time as you're getting ready to jump into spring football here. And I uh, can't wait to watch y'all in the spring and in the fall. I appreciate it. Always great being on with you. GBO. Of course, Coach Josh Heupel. How about that, huh? Dialing it up. Going to get us a catch. I, that's, that's how you know he's a good host and get your boy a catch here. Uh, years removed from having to actually play the sport. But of course, appreciate all of Coach's time. Man, I am fascinated to see how they do utilize the radios. We're going to try and get up there in the spring to check in on Coach Heupel and what they got going for, uh, for spring ball. But um, that's going to be something to watch, not just for Josh Heupel. Across the college football world, how these offensive coordinators adapt their structure and adapt their scheme, because I think there's uh, some opportunities to be had. And if we know anything about Tennessee and Josh Heupel, uh, they take advantage of every single opportunity. Speaking of offenses, though, in the college football world, who are going to be the most dangerous offenses in 2024? We said at the top of this live show, man, like there is no longer a world where you can just ground and pound your way to a national championship. If you want to win it all, and every single fan base in America wants to at least win their conference and expects past that to go do some things in this new college football playoff format, you got to score more than 35. It's got to be somewhere in the range of 40. And I'm not saying consistently, but at least enough – maybe once or twice a year to win a shootout. you got to play versatile styles. So some of those teams that I expect to be well-versed to play in a versatile style of game, let's start with Oregon. 68% of that production from a season ago is back. They scored over 41 points a game. I know what you're saying. J.D., Troy Franklin, their leading receiver, he's gone to the league. Bo Nix, the man, the myth, the legend in Eugene, he's gone to the league. How are they going to keep it going? Well, they brought in Evan Stewart who was the best wide receiver in the portal over from Texas A&M. He is just a physical specimen, going to win his matchups, going to thrive in this offense. And you bring in someone who I like to call left-handed Bo Nix, which is, of course, Dylan Gabriel. Talked to Dan Lanning on this very show. I believe it was somewhere around a week and a half, two weeks ago. And the reason why they love Dylan Gabriel, outside of all of his physical attributes, he brings a ton of experience to the table. So you're not going to have Dylan Gabriel out there with a lot of overwhelming feelings, regardless of who they're playing against. He's been there. He's done that, played on the biggest stages, and had a lot of success. What they want to do offensively is get you going side to side as a defense, get your eyes all mixed up, and they do a lot of that with attacking the perimeter. It could be the jet sweep. <coughs> Quick cough there. No, I don't know mercy. Uh, it could be the jet sweep. It could be the, the quick pass on the outside. They want to get your secondary and your linebackers, get their eyes all mixed up. And when they get you flowing one way, they'll come right back the other way with an uh, inside zone or with a counter, whatever it looks like. And so the reason why they are so effective 
at getting those eyes mixed up is because of how efficient they are. So Dylan Gabriel and his efficiency is going to be paramount to them having success offensively. And when they have that success, when they get that, that rhythm going, that momentum going, watch for some big run plays. Five and a half yards of carry last season, good for top five in the country. So I want to get you flowing and then take advantage of that with uh, their scheme. Texas, bringing back 74% of their production offensively from a season ago where they scored 36 last year. Key part of that, obviously, was Quinn Ewers and bringing him back for another year in Austin is absolutely massive. But you do lose your top two wide receivers. Xavier Worthy, Adonai Mitchell, leave him behind over 1,000 yards receiving in terms of what you have to make up with losing both of them. They went to the portal heavy and got after it there, landing Isaiah Bond from Alabama, Silas Bolden from Oregon State, Amari Nyblack from Alabama, the tight end. They got some weapons now. Now, as much as we think about Texas and their ability to push the ball downfield, of course they want to do that, and we'll talk about that more in a second. But Texas and Steve Sarkeesian's offensive attack is built on running the football. It's built on running the football. And last year, they did that about as well as anybody. They averaged close to 200 yards a game on the ground. A lot of inside zone. A lot of just physical attitude on that offensive line. And then when you got a team to be in a bind and and have to commit to the run earlier, they're tired of getting gashed. They're tired of having to tackle C.J. Baxter at four yards. We're going to go up and try and tackle him at two yards. When you get too aggressive, hand in the cookie jar, that's when Xavier Worthy would hurt you. Now, this year, instead of Xavier Worthy, it'll be Silas Bolden. It'll be Isaiah Bond. So I love that Quinn Ewers is back for this offense, clearly. I mean, he was 69% completion on all of his passes last year. He's really efficient. So they're going to keep you guessing offensively, and they got some guys to get it to when you start guessing, whether it be the guys in that backfield. And they've got some more guys, too, that I think are, uh, are going to be making some, some waves this year in Austin. Trey Wisner. Haven't even seen what he is yet in Austin. Uh, dude is a stud. Got to see him play a lot in high school. And then you got receivers to, to make you miss in space and kind of keep that same pace going. The big part of this, the Wi-Fi of the offense now, Quinn Ewers. He knows where to go with the football. He's going to help get his receivers up to speed. With all those new faces, Texas, without question, one of the most dangerous offenses in 2024. How about Ohio State, huh? This is a team that is typically on this list in the preseason. Last year, man, I don't know that you could say Ohio State was one of the most dangerous offenses in the country. That's no shade to Ohio State. They just, quite frankly, were not what we've seen them be. Now that we're breaking in a new quarterback with Kyle McCord, clearly had some sort of conversation after the season. They're going to have a new quarterback this year. Fully expect that to be Will Howard. Um, The scheme, I think, is still TBD. Chip Kelly is a mastermind. We've seen that throughout his coaching career. I think the offense will still resemble what we've seen from him across his career. I think it'll be run to pass. I think it will be tempo. I think it will be get the ball to your players in space and set up plays for them to ball in space, whether it be Emeka Ebuka, whether it be Jeremiah Smith. We go down the list here, and that's the other part of this. Like I'm I'm putting them on this list, yes, because I think the scheme is going to be solid, even though we're still not 100% what that's going to look like. But the personnel across the board, man, is just, I mean, it's diabolical. You know what you're getting in Will Howard. I think people got to put some respect on Will Howard's name, calling him a a slight, a a 2.0 of Kyle McCord. I was going to say slight upgrade. I think he's not a slight upgrade. I just think he's an upgrade. And so you pair that with what you have at the skill positions with Travion Henderson when he's healthy. Quinshawn Judkins was a beast in the SEC in that running back room. They're going to have a lot of players to get the ball to. And I think all the concerns that folks have about the offensive line, that's fine. I think the way that Chip Kelly is going to scheme it, they're going to be able to, I don't know if hide is the right word, but compensate where they don't have what they need. Chip Kelly at Oregon, he wasn't working with five-star offensive linemen. A lot of three-star guys, and they just were, were able to take the defense where they wanted them to go. Wasn't overpowering them, a lot of zone schemes. And uh, all that's to say, I love the personnel. I love Chip Kelly on this staff. And I think the most important part of this whole thing with Ohio State is the synergy with Chip Kelly and Ryan Day. Like, it's, it's something that you can't really quantify. What's the chemistry between your OC and head coach? There's, there's no way around that. But I do think that there's something to be said for being on the same page as your head coach. And Ryan Day passing the sticks to Chip Kelly to call the offense, something we've seen Ryan Day make his name for in college football and trusting him with that side of the ball, I don't think that should be overlooked. And I think the trust factor there is, uh, is absolutely massive. So Ohio State, definitely one of the top offenses in 2024, going into the season at least. Ole Miss, man, had to put them on this list. 
71% of that production that scored 32 points a game in the SEC. They're back. Starts and ends with Jackson Dart. And we, and we, we have been pretty much on the first car of the hype train for, for Jackson Dart, man. Like, I think he's taken a, a tremendous step from year one to year two. That's obvious. But I'm projecting him to take a big step again from year two to year three. Because the RPO offense, man, it is something that takes a while to get comfortable in, especially as a quarterback where you got to make a decision in a split second whether you're going to give it, whether you're going to pull it and throw it, whether you're going to pull it and run it. Like There was so much on his plate that he had to digest going from year one to year two, having never been in an offense like this before. As he goes from year two to year three, there's some real continuity here that he can build off of. And I love the way they run this offense, too. They're going to attack the perimeter, much like Oregon. Heard a, a clinic from Charlie Weiss, their OC out there. We're going to try and make corners make tackles. Because when corners have to make tackles, usually they don't make them. So, I mean, you appreciate that from Charlie Weiss, just the transparency there. Trey Harris, Juice Wells, you can't cover both of them with two guys. you got to give one of them single coverage. And when you do that, I think they're going to win their matchup. I'm really excited about Ole Miss. The tempo they play with, too, is just a total equalizer for any games where they don't have the personnel they need to have. Can they beat the Georgias? Can they beat the, the LSUs and the Alabamas consistently? They beat LSU last year. We're outmatched against Georgia. I'm curious to see what Ole Miss does in 2024. But Ole Miss, definitely going to be dangerous. Probably another 30-plus point year from them offensively every single game. Any given game, rather, on average. Now, <coughs> Tennessee, <coughs> excuse me, look off. Uh, Tennessee scored over 32 points a game last year. Didn't really feel like it. It wasn't really the offense we saw from Josh Heupel and company in 2022. But I think last year was a testament to how good of an offensive coordinator Josh Heupel really is. Because with Joe Milton playing quarterback for you, I think you had a lot of the things that you needed. Okay, maybe not everything you wanted, a lot of things that you needed. Clearly, you scored 32 points a game, so you were able to be successful in that regard. But the fact that you, in my opinion, from an ability standpoint now, upgrade with Nico Iamaliava running the show for you, I think you're going to see an explosion offensively because this receiving core adds some guys, whether it be Mike Matthews, five-star true freshman who's going to ball for them, whether it be Squirrel White getting a chance to take another step, Brew McCoy getting healthy. I think that's going to create more options for him. And also we talked about it with Coach Heupel, but like if they, if they go even faster with this radio communication, it's going to be a nightmare to play against Tennessee. They spread the field against you. We've talked about it a lot on this show. They're going to make you cover all 53.3 yards of width of the field. And when they win their matchup, they got a quarterback now that can consistently hit the bullseye for you. That's the difference now. I think consistency from Nico is going to make this offense really hum. Tennessee, without question, one of the best offenses in the country going into the season. If, it's a big if, if Nico Iamaliava hits the ground running like I think he's going to hit the ground running. Last one here. Don't fall asleep on Arizona. I don't have a ton to break down here because it's a, it's a new staff for Arizona, Dino Babers. Remember Dino Babers? He was at Syracuse. He's now the quarterbacks and OC coach there. Keep an eye on them. They scored over 34 points a game last year in, in the, the Pac-12. Rest in peace, Pac-12. They bring back Noah Fafita, their, their quarterback last year. They bring back Tetaroa McMillan, who had over 1,400 yards, 90 receptions, and 10 touchdowns. 70% of that production on offense. I know the staff changes, but a lot of those pieces are still there. Would not surprise me in the slightest if that offense took another step and was north of 35 points a game this year at Arizona. So let me know who we missed there. I'm sure there was some, some schools that you would want mentioned that we didn't get to there, but regardless, those for me are the most dangerous offenses in 2024 heading into the season. Could have kept Georgia on that list. Didn't put Georgia on there, but Georgia probably makes that list as well. Just a lot of teams there. All right, got a, got a great question from one of you. Joe Rutland reached out and said, did Sark do a bang-up job re recruiting at Texas this past season? Joe, a friend of the program, we appreciate you adding to the conversation, man. The short answer is yes. The short answer is yes. Steve Sarkeesian, once again, did a phenomenal job recruiting at Texas. Made a, made a nice little push uh, towards signing day to end up near that top five. They finished at, as a number six class in 2024. And the thing with me with Texas is it, it wasn't just a this year thing for Steve Sarkeesian. Last year in 2023, they had the number three class in the country. And it's not just the ranking. Like, of course, the ranking is what gets the headline, right? The ranking is what you go to the message board with. And the ranking is what you go to the water cooler with and tell your buddy who's an OU fan, hey, we recruited at this level. 
take that. And th- I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. That's what recruiting rankings in my mind are, are for as us college football fans. But they're not just recruiting talent. They're recruiting physicality. They're recruiting like an SEC team in the trenches. I mean, this past season, Brandon Baker, one of the high-profile offensive linemen from modern day. Modern day, they play good high school football out there in Southern California. I'm biased, of course, but that's how I feel about it. Colin Simmons. Everybody wanted Colin Simmons. Big-time edge defender. Texas got him. And then in the 2023 class, landed Anthony Hill, who contributed for you this season at Texas. Colton Vasek, same deal. Two guys at the, at the linebacker edge position that contributed for you in a big way this past season. It's not just talent. It's physicality. This is a tough Texas outfit. And they don't just have the mentality. It's also the players to execute that physicality. And you need that in the SEC. There's no way around it. You cannot lack physicality and walk into the Southeastern Conference and expect to be successful. Well, the good news for Texas is they already got themselves a pretty good litmus test this past year. Now you lose to Andre Sweat and Byron Murphy. There's no way around it. There's no replacing those guys. But I think the temperature, the, the tenor that that defense has and the overall roster has, what you saw against Alabama, where they beat them by double digits, that I, I don't think that was a fluke. I think that was real. And I think that's who New Texas is. So that's the, the, physic, the physicality part of this for Texas. But on top of that, man, like they will always attract top offensive talent. Why? Because Steve Sarkeesian is their head coach. Like, I know if I go play for Steve Sarkeesian, whether I'm a quarterback, a running back, a wide receiver, we're going to score points. We're going to run a fun style of offense. I'm going to get developed, which is probably the most important part for a lot of these guys. Just ask Arch Manning, and we're going to win ball games. And the winning the ball games thing was always something you probably tangentially applied to Steve Sarkeesian. Hey, he won as an OC at Alabama. He had some success in the NFL. Well, he's having success at Texas now in a real way. There's, there's no more vision casting if you're a recruit at Texas. When you come on the visit, they don't say, okay, well, hey, you come here, help us get to a, a conference title. They won the conference last year. Now I understand the SEC is a different beast, but they're winning football games now at Texas. Made the college football playoff last year. They were a play away from making it to the national title. Texas has now got the real proof of concept where you don't have to try and pitch this big picture vision. You still do that when it comes to recruiting, obviously, but you say, hey, come keep us on track. Hey, come play for us here and help us get to where we want to go because we're already at this level. We just need to take a little bit of a jump up. It's not this massive, hey, we went five and seven last year. Help bring Texas back. That's not, thing, that's not a thing you're saying anymore when you come visit the 40 Acres. And Steve Sarkeesian doesn't have to say that. And so in that way, I think that's, that's dangerous for the rest of college football. Looking at how they recruit and, and how they can recruit, less blanks to fill in if you're a recruit, like I just mentioned. They're a national brand when it comes to Texas. You know, you know what it is when you see that logo. You know what it is when you see that burnt orange. There's only one school and one program you associate with that burnt orange. They're surrounded by talent. Texas does not have to go far to go find guys that are going to help them right away. Texas is a massive state, obviously, but to jump in the car and go see somebody as opposed to jumping on a flight and seeing somebody, jumping in the chopper and seeing somebody, very big difference. The number of touch points you can have with different recruits, the consistency of touch points you can have with top recruits by being in that state, absolutely massive. Probably the biggest part of this too, or one of the biggest parts of this, well-resourced. If you you go play at Texas, you know that there is – things in place there to take care of you. So it's the world of college football right now. The NIL model is real. And uh, Texas, from what I can tell, is winning and competing in that part as well. For my money, man, Texas, Steve Sarkeesian, how they're recruiting right now at a high level. But I think on the field, they're just getting started. Just getting started on the 40 acres. (coughs) Golly, man. Got to push through here. Got to push through here. Hey, got got another great question from one of y'all. Also, this is just a great user handle. Petty Wop. He asks, who do you think, or I'll rephrase that, what do you think the perfect college football playoff would look like? So, shouts out to Petty Wop. That's a hilarious handle. We got some thoughts on this. First things first, though, make sure you're subscribed. If you're watching this show as a one-off video, like you went and found this in its, let's say it's 10-ish or so minutes, Glad to have you here. Make sure you're subscribed to college football all the time. But when you're subscribed, you make sure you don't miss the live show of The Hard Count, which is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern. 
where we just talk college football for an hour. It's glorious, and we hear from you all via the live chat. So make sure you're locked in for that. Best way to lock in, making sure you subscribe. So thank you for that. So the way that we approach this thing, I'm assuming we're not staying at four teams. I've been a big fan of the four-team model. I think the four-team model checks a lot of boxes for what I want in a college football playoff, but I threw the four-team model out the window because I think that probably gives us the best answer to this question. So how many teams are we putting in our playoff? We're going with a six-team college football playoff model. The one seed and the two seed, you get a bye. But why six teams? For me, we've stood on this soapbox for a while right now, and we're going to keep standing on it. The emphasis stays on the regular season. The regular season, that is what has made college football college football since its existence. I understand you'll get more games in the 12-team playoff. I want more games to matter during the regular season. I want Ohio State, Michigan being played the last weekend of the season, meaning as much as humanly possible. That's how I feel about it. On the right year, you might get a two-loss team in that six in that six spot. Heck, maybe maybe you find a two-loss team in that five spot. Depends on the year, but for the most part, it's going to be one-loss teams or undefeated teams that make our perfect college football playoff model. Just for the record, tripling the field from four to twelve. We're shouting at a cloud here. We're probably on an island shouting this. This never made any sense. Never made any sense to say let's go from four teams to twelve teams. I digress. How are we deciding these six teams, J.D.? We're going conference champions. We're going automatic bids. How are we doing this? We're going with the same process as this four-team format. Before you yell at me, I'm not staying with the same committee. I love the committee. I appreciate the committee, what they've done for college football. It is the worst job in the world every time you get to that first weekend of December and you have to make a a choice on Selection Sunday. I get it. But we're going to add some more folks to that room. Like, I want people that have been around college football, that played college football, that coached college football, that watch college football in the sicko-like fashion that you and I watch college football from 7 a.m. to however late, 2 a.m., Pac-12 after dark, rest in peace. I want those people in the room. So I'm going to go ahead and add Kirk Herbstreit to the committee. I'm adding Joel Klatt to the committee. Uh, Nick Saban, he's done at Alabama. You're in the committee. Reese Davis, Reese Davis watches a lot of ball, dude. You watch him on college game day, he's pulling out wild trivia facts that nobody else on the desk can answer. He's on the committee. So I feel good about my committee. We're still going with the six highest ranked teams. Going back to our, our format here. Round one, three versus six. In terms of seeding, four versus five. Now the one seed and the two seed, kick them up, you got to buy. The beautiful part about this for the, for the first round, man, we're on campus. That's the thing that I think this 12-team model got right, taking college football back to the people. I want to see a playoff game in South Bend, Indiana. I want to see a playoff game in Baton, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I want to see a playoff game in Columbus, Ohio. Wherever it's at, college football playoff games on campus, that's going to be cinematic. That's going to be so cool, and I love that we're getting that in the 12-team model. I just want us to have two of them, though, for this first round of, of a playoff games. You still get the electricity factor of being on campus, but I love the fact that we would get national focus on our college football playoff games by having just two. In this 12-team format, you'll have a bunch of them, and you'll kind of keep up with a couple of them. I'm sure you'll, you'll watch all of them. I, don't get it twisted, but the fact that you just got two being played on the same day, that's going to be awesome. So on campus in that first round, we love it. Now, moving on to round two, the winner of four versus five plays the one seed. The winner of three versus six plays the two seed. Now, for this game, I want bowl sites. And I love the fact that we go to the campus in the first round. The reason I want a bowl site, though, is because I want the environment to be as controlled as possible for our semifinal games. And not because I don't love the the on-campus aspect. I think that's great. There's no other way to, you know, recreate that. And that's why college football is special. But the neutral site, we get, you know, the, the Jerry Worlds. We get Mercedes-Benz in Atlanta. We get a roof over the whole thing. As much as I would love to see a game played in Ann Arbor, Michigan, for a chance to go to the national championship, that'd be awesome. I don't love the weather factor there. Like, the weather factor, I think, could in some ways give a too decided of an advantage to the home team. If Michigan's out there and they're playing, let's just say they're playing USC. That's going to happen now, but USC, not used to playing in the cold. Maybe they are in the Big Ten. It's probably a bad example. Let's say we got Michigan and we got Miami. Miami's played indoors. They've played in you know nicer weather. 
You hear what I'm saying? That would be a massive advantage to Michigan. I want those environments, those variables controlled as much as possible. So from there, this is what gets me fired up, man. This, this, is, this is what got me juiced about this whole segment. Our national championship game is going to be two things. One, permanently at the Rose Bowl. Second, played on Saturday. We'll start with the Rose Bowl. I went to one national championship game when it was played at the Rose Bowl. It was Auburn. It was Florida State. And it was absolutely unbelievable. Thankfully, I have had the privilege to go to a couple more as part of this job, which is just still hilarious to say out loud that going to the national championship game is a part of our job. But the environment in the Rose Bowl, I was second to last row. I was probably as far back from the field as you could be. My dad got tickets the day before the game. Someone just gave them to him from his work. It was absolutely unbelievable. But that environment, I thought, still felt very much so college football-ish. Does that make sense? Like, the, the games that are played at these other sites are still great productions. The people that put on the college football playoff, man, first class, second to none. But with that being said, there's a certain corporate feel about a game being played in NRG Stadium or a game being played in Los Angeles. Awesome venues. Awesome venues. Nothing against it. But with our sport and what makes it so special, the tradition, the pageantry, the venues themselves that are specific to college football, like the Rose Bowl, we understand this. Now you move into halftime and that sun starts to set on the mountains and it just becomes essentially an oil painting being played in front of you for four quarters. Like that's special. That's very special. And I think the fact that it would be played at the Rose Bowl helps helps preserve as much as possible what makes our game special and it gets put in front of everybody on national television. Oh, that's college football. That's the Rose Bowl. No discussion about it. So that's the first part of this. The other part of this is being played on Saturday. If we're making the perfect college football playoff model, our national title game is on Saturday. When, when was it ever decided to play the national championship game, the biggest game in the entirety of the year, on a day that is pretty much for the most part never played a college football playoff game through the regular season. College football is a Saturday sport. Let's make the biggest game of the entire calendar year on Saturday. Can we do that? Can we lock in for that? Great. Appreciate it. So for us, again, to review this here, our college football playoff model is round one, three versus six, four versus five. We're on campus, baby. Absolutely love it. Round two, one and two. They're playing the winners of those matchups. At a bowl site, I want controlled environment, controlled variables, national title game, Saturday, Rose Bowl, perfect. No other way to say it. It would be absolutely perfect. Six teams with a committee, emphasis on the regular season as much as possible. I think it'd be, I think it'd be awesome. I think it'd be awesome. I, I'm not saying we have to stick with it forever, but let's just try it out. Let's just try it out. Four to 12 never really made that much sense. So those are... Uh, those are what we would put into the, the college football playoff, and that would be for us, for our money, perfect model. But let me know what y'all think. Excited to hear y'all's feedback on that. Should be good. All right. <coughs> About to get to some of y'all's questions here in the live chat in a short matter of moments. Before we do that, though, got one more segment. Before we do that, a quick word from the folks that make this show possible. Yes, y'all, first and foremost. But second, the hard count is brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. Now, Game Time, fast, easy, safe, efficient, effective, affordable, whatever adjective you want to put to it, that's how you should get your tickets. College football season, around the corner. It'll, it'll be here before you know it. So when college football season gets here, definitely use Game Time. But I understand before that, maybe you want to get out and go to a baseball game. Maybe you want to get out and go to a basketball game. Get, get to a concert, comedy show, whatever you want to go to, Game Time, they got tickets for that. Beautiful part about it. You know that you're getting the best price on your ticket. When you buy a ticket, you're able to, one, see the view. Two, if you find a, another platform has your seat for the same price, your seat in the same row and section for less than what you paid for, rather, Game Time credits you 110% of that difference. So download the Game Time app. Use code HARDCOUNT for $20 off your first purchase. Again, HARDCOUNT, H A R D. C-O-U-N-T for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Game time. Best tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. So we appreciate game time. Making that happen for us, making it happen for y'all. Getting the folks to the games. Gotta love it. 
You got to love it. Okay, one more question here from one of y'all. From our friend CF Budge. CFB Budge does great work. Appreciate him asking this question. He actually sent me his own preview magazine before the season. It was phenomenal. He asks, who do you think the sleeping giants in college football are? And this is a, this is a tricky question because I think it's hard to – it's hard to determine what your criteria is. Is Sleeping Giant, hey, they could be, but they just haven't ever been? Hey, they could be because we've seen them be before. And so what does that mean? My criteria was brand, national brand. Are you, are you relevant nationally? Is there a fan base there that would provide a care factor in terms of providing resources, providing NIL opportunities, things of that nature? And then also there is something to be said for track record. Like Nebraska... There's no way around it, man. They are a sleeping giant in college football. Sleeping giant in college football. We've seen what Nebraska has been. There's footprints on the moon in Lincoln. I don't think there is a higher care factor anywhere in the country than Lincoln, Nebraska. And when I say care factor, their fans are rabid in person and on YouTube, on social media. Like, they care and they love their Huskers. That is their professional team. And so if they start winning... If Matt Rule, and we believe this, Matt Rule is going to get that thing off the ground and they start having some success, it's going to compound. People are going to get more involved. There's going to be more excitement. There's going to be more juice. That's how Nebraska operates. That's how Nebraska football has operated before when they were a national brand. I don't think that's something that we're going to have to go our lifetime before Nebraska is back to national relevance. So Nebraska, without question, a sleeping giant. Texas A&M, I don't think there's a place that is better resourced in all of America I can't prove it, but when it comes to the yeses you get at Texas A&M, have to imagine they far and vastly outnumber the no's that you would get if you're asking for things. Uh, Recruiting footprint for them, being in the state of Texas, absolutely prime. For a long time, they were the only SEC school in the state. Now Texas is joining the show, so that's going to change things a little bit. But the way that I look at this, man, you have everything you need to win right there in College Station. Everything you need. And that's the other part, too. College Station... Got to work there for a short period of time doing local news. Austin is awesome. Um, other, other cities within the SEC are phenomenal. But College Station, Texas, I, I only use Austin because I think it's important to differentiate their potential advantage they could have over a school like Texas if they were to get it rolling. College Station revolves around Texas A&M. Austin has other opportunities. College Station is all about A&M. So if that's what you're looking for as a recruit and Texas A&M starts winning, they could get rolling here. They could get rolling. So they're, they're like a Ferrari in my mind, like a powder keg. If you, you get the right driver in that car, which Mike Elko very much so could be, if you light that powder keg on fire, it would be a very massive explosion in a real good way. Florida, I think, is also a sleeping giant. And there's probably some debate to be had about how asleep are they. J.D., they're not that far removed from double-digit win seasons and playing in Atlanta for the SEC title. I totally hear that. But I think when you look at the opportunity for Florida <laughs> – The opportunity for Florida, for me, revolves around the word the. Florida is the school in the state in the conference, which is the SEC. If you want to stay in the Sunshine State and you want to compete in the best conference in America, you go to Florida. These kids just need a reason to go to Florida. They're well-resourced. We've seen that. The brand is massive from a, a national standpoint. If they start winning, that thing is going to compound quick, fast, and in a hurry when it comes to Florida. So how asleep are they? It's a fair question to ask, but I think if they get rolling, they would wreak havoc on the rest of college football. Probably because they have the same thing about Miami. I feel like it's difficult to do a segment like this about Sleeping Giants and not mention Miami. We've seen what they were with the 30 for 30 documentary around the U and you know what Howard Schnellenberger did, you know, putting the, the state of Miami and, and the fence around that. If they recruit Miami well, Miami – can once again be Miami. I think they're on that upward trajectory right now with their trend. Here's a couple more that are uh, maybe a little more off the radar. Virginia Tech, man, just as a college football fan, as a college football romantic, this is one that I think we need. This is a massive brand. Just because it hasn't been recently doesn't mean it isn't in college football. And there's a certain aura around Virginia Tech football, especially when it's up and humming. Like when Frank Beamer was there, man, they were rolling. They had double-digit win seasons from 2004 to 2011 every single year. Enter Sandman is a spectacle of its own that I've only seen from my television, but I want to see in person one day. You got the lunch pail. There's a certain, again, just a, a mystique around Virginia Tech that when they're up and humming is really captured and I think adds to the college football ecosystem. There's also a lot of talent in Virginia. 
do not get it twisted. There's a lot of good high school football being played in Virginia. And when those guys stay home and go to Virginia Tech, it changes the game. Mike Vick from Virginia. Tyrod Taylor, Hampton, Virginia. If you keep the Virginia guys in Virginia and get them to VT, I think that could be, uh, could be the path towards Virginia Tech being awake as a, as a giant in the college football space. Last one to get to here, and this is probably the one where you gotta, gotta stretch a little bit. You gotta kinda get, get the tip of the fingertips out there, and maybe you're, maybe you'll, uh, again, a little bit of a stretch here. I think SMU could be a sleeping giant in college football. And the Pony Express, the Pony Excess, rather, that great documentary from ESPN, I think that tells the story. They were doing NIL before NIL was a thing, right? Which is, of course, illegal. Not to say everybody wasn't doing it, but SMU got caught. It is what it is. When NIL wasn't, wasn't a thing and they were doing NIL, they were co-national champs was SMU. And so now NIL is legal and SMU has, is entered into the ACC. There's so much talent in that DFW area. I'm just saying, TCU, we've, we've seen what they can do when they're able to acquire some of those guys that are able to, to be in that area and be able to be talented that way. I think that probably you have to have some, some stadium renovations if you're SMU. I've been to that stadium. It's awesome. If you want to be a, a giant in the college football space, probably might need to up your game there. But the thing with SMU, they're good for it, man. They got some deep pockets out there in Dallas. Highland Park, deep pockets. So I would love for SMU to, get, to be a, a giant in the college football space. They're probably in a deeper sleep than most of the, the schools on this list. But I'm just saying, again, go back to track record. We've seen SMU be SMU and be a national prominence, be a nationally prominent SMU um, in a pre-NIL era. Well, now NIL is legal. So we'll see what SMU does there. Well-resourced. Re- relevant brand. I don't know if they're super, super nationally prominent. Again, that's the stretch, but I thought we had to put SMU on that list as a, as a good conversation piece for us. Speaking of conversation piece, man, let's get to some of y'all's conversation pieces here, getting to the live chat, bringing on that man, Nick Brake. Nick, what's going on, brother? What are the people saying today? A lot of arguing. It's, this has been one of the funniest arguments I've ever seen, and it's been in good faith, too. It's been Sandman um, with David Ferris. It started very uh, simple about Tennessee versus uh, Texas football. Somehow ended up with Tennessee saving Texas at the Alamo with the volunteers. Yeah, okay. So that's... It, it really... Uh, went full circle in American history. So uh, shout out to those two. And then shout out for Drew for settling it with one settle message and everyone was nice and happy. That's a convincing so, argument to make. It was. It's pretty That's valid. a convincing <laughs> argument to make, man. It's pretty valid. Golly. Um, but anyway, uh, Ferris Khan asked a good question. Rate right the start of the show. Says, SJD, in this new college football Wild West, is it possible for a team to be transformational and not transactional? Which is Michigan's NIL strategy. And lastly... Is it simply going to be about the highest bidder going forward? The answer to is it going to be about the highest bidder going forward? I don't know. Um, I think you might see more of that when it comes to roster retention. I think we're going to get closer and closer, or we're getting further and further, rather, into a world where you're not going to see that $10 million spent on a recruit, and that's a, a number I just threw out there. Like You're not going to see these wild figures thrown at high school students because you understand now just like when you draft a rookie from the NFL, there's a chance they don't translate. There's a chance that they don't hit the ground running and have the success that you're paying them to have on the front end. So roster retention is a word you're going to hear a lot of over the course of the next couple of years, especially that day after the, the college football, uh, not playoff, the day after the conference title games happen and set up, you know, portal Monday becomes a thing. Um, so all that's to say, I think it's possible. I think that's probably what the schools that are really successful will have to do is say, come here. When you ball, we'll pay you. And I, that's kind of what you hear behind closed doors is like the, the Georgias, the Michigans, the whatever, the, those schools that harp on development and that aren't needing more five stars, they're able to kind of take that approach. So kind of the chicken and the egg kind of situation. But that's my thought process on the whole thing. Okay. Um, next question coming from the truth. A rare question by the truth that isn't uh, dogging Ohio State. So. There we go. Shout out them today. Uh, says the best three coaches in college football that develops underscouted talent, in your opinion. Underscouted talent. That's a great question. I think well, I would have said Jim Harbaugh, but he's obviously gone to the NFL. I think we, we did a segment on this on the channel. Kirby Smart, man. 
And as much credit as they get for recruiting five stars, it's all 100% due to them. They've recruited a fair amount of three stars, too, and had a ton of success. So I think Kirby Smart is definitely on that list. Who else would you go with there? You probably look at Matt Rule being one of those guys that is a tremendous evaluator. I mean, they were winning with Baylor, or they were winning at Baylor, rather, with three stars. Um, Matt Rule will go. Who's a third coach to throw out here? I think Kirk Ferentz has done a phenomenal job at Iowa. Like, they're not landing five stars. Matt Campbell, another guy who's really been a great developer of lower-level talent and, and guys that are having success now in the NFL, from a Brees Hall to a Brock Purdy. I mean, so those are probably some names that I would, I would pay attention to when it comes to the, the yeah. elite evaluators. Um, man, this question, Sandman's trying to settle the debate, I think, putting you in a bad spot. It says, who is closer to winning the SEC in an Addy, Texas or Tennessee? It's a great question. Let's see how we can answer this yeah. on the fence. I, guess. I would say Texas. I mean, I, okay. have, I mean, I would say Texas is closer. They've made the college football playoff last year. Tennessee's breaking a new quarterback. I think he's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. But I think based on what we've seen this year, it's not a stretch to say Texas is probably closer. Now, yeah. could that change this time next year? 100%. But Texas right now is closer by definition of what they did last year and who they have coming back. Man, I just I don't I don't know. I think that's a very good point. Um, but I think they're both going to have a bright future. Either, neither of them are like, man, future's not looking too good. Yeah, both have the arrow pointing up, it feels yeah, like, absolutely. without question. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Uh, King Epic says, in a future show, could you do a breakdown of your top 10 college football players over the past uh, quarter century? That would be good. I, I, I just saw that in the chat, too. That would be one that I think we need to... I'm not finding to look into that one. I'm trying to think who would even be yeah, who's number in one? contention. It'd be tough to not go so heavy on the quarterbacks. Yeah. Joe Burrow's up there, obviously. That whole 2019 LSU team is up there. Johnny Manziel's up there. Yeah, we could have Reggie Bush. How do you leave out Reggie Bush? Like, mm -hmm. 10, 10 is a tough number to uh, Cam Newton. Like, yeah, that would be fun. Might have to do that here at a, at a future show. Good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Landon says, uh, JD, do you think LSU makes the playoffs if they beat Ole Miss or Alabama? They play both at home. So basically, can they lose one and still make it? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're going to see an SEC team be 10-2 and two and make the playoffs. So if LSU goes 10-2, and two, I think they're in. Would be as, as straightforward as I could put it. 10-2 and two SEC team, you're in the dance. Probably the same as a Big Ten team. If you're 10-2 and two in, in the Big Ten, you're probably in the dance. So just the way that the new college football playoff is going to work, it wouldn't work in our – perfect college football playoff model that mm -hmm. we just put together but 10 and 2 in the, in the 12 team format from either of those conferences probably puts you in now ACC if you're 10 and 2 I don't know if you get in from the big 12 10 and 2 I don't know if you get in but the SEC I think you should feel pretty good about that um Landon went further and said that they think that LSU are being underestimated and that they think their schedule actually isn't too bad this year JD I'll pull that up if you want we yeah can. please do let's let's take a look at this thing step by step I mean, LSU, playing in the SEC, just period for LSU. Like, mm -hmm. you're going to have a, a – I don't know if, like, easy schedule is ever the, the verbiage to use there. But when you look <laughs> yeah. at LSU's schedule here, you open with USC, which in itself That's is tough. just brutal, man. <laughs> the good news, like they mentioned, Ole Miss at home, at Arkansas, at A&M. A&M's a tremendous wild card. Like, we'll see what A&M even is. Bama mm -hmm. at Florida. You finish with Oklahoma, which will be fun. A lot of the big ones are at home, though, which is, which is a great point to make. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how they phrase that, I think, is what it says. It sets, the schedule sets up great. I think that's pretty true. It does um, set up. Yeah. Gosh, that middle part, though, when you go Ole Miss through Bama, that's going yeah. to be brutal. So I don't know if I would ever say it's, uh, it's doable. That might be something we have to do in the future here is do a toughest schedules Yeah, I mean, that's one here. of them. Yeah. LSU looks like they might be in the running, depending on how many teams we go with there. Man. Opening with USC is just tough, man. Part of that non-conference, that's tough. Yeah, I just looked at the schedule. I was like, oh, they don't have to play Texas. They don't have to play Georgia. This is nice. And then I mean, you just get into the weeds. And, oh, the well, they've got to play this team and that team. Yeah. It's tough. Uh, two questions about the future of college football. And then we'll head out. How's that, JD? Love it. Let's do it. Um, this first one, which had a reference, someone else in the chat is like, man, this is a great question. It's also by the truth. It says, 10 year, or the last 10 years from, uh, who do you think has had the best quick turnaround in college football? Being awful 10 years ago to now either being pretty good or great. That is a really good question. Wow. Hard to just list one team there in the last 10 years. I mean, Texas is probably in that discussion. I mean, 10 years ago, Texas 
was not that great. They had that one pop year with Ellinger, but outside of that, like Texas didn't have a, a ton to be overwhelmingly proud about. Who else can we talk about here that's in this this turnaround category? Texas is up there. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if turnaround's the right word. LSU turnaround is definitely the wrong word, so I don't even want to talk about them. But they got over that hump where they couldn't find a quarterback. So turnaround transformation is probably the word I would use with LSU being able to have two Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks in the last decade in itself deserves some uh, some applause there. Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll stick with Texas. I think Texas okay. and what they've done in this last decade is nothing short of phenomenal. Honorable mention, JD. Shout out UAB, whose program was cut, and now they're in yes. a pretty good conference. They're in the A10. So. They were left for dead. Yeah, left for dead, and the boys bounce back. And upgraded conferences pretty significantly. Without question. Um, okay, I lied about having one more. Let's go two more pretty quick. Love though. it. Um, Ferris Khan says, J.D., if Oregon, Michigan, and Ohio State all end up in the top eight, wouldn't the team that does not make the Big Ten title game be better off realistically? They get a bye instead of playing that game. Seeding matters, I think. Uh, going back to that question, the truth said, I say Kansas. Absolutely right. That's Kansas, a great. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that. that's it. No question. Hundred percent. Kansas is the correct answer there. I see where you're coming from. In some ways, in some ways, I think like if you're a competitor, you just you want to win the ultimate goal, which is you want to win the ultimate prize, which is winning your conference. I see the thought process there. I think that the buy in the college football playoff though is the buy you want. So being able to win your conference and have that buy is probably the way that I would go about it. I see the thought process, but again, like. I just think there's there's too many too many variables for you to feel like yeah it's good we missed this this uh, this conference title game good for us I think it, I mean I just think it's it's still an uphill climb either way you slice it. Um, last question, OG Gary wouldn't be a show without OG Gary there says imagine it's 2030. What do you think about the state of college football in that year, and how do you think college football will be six years from now? 2030, man, that might be super league territory. Mm -hmm. I really think so. I mean, we, we might be sitting here and saying, okay, we got the SEC and the Big Ten. Another thing that's interesting to consider, which one of my buddies was talking to me about this the other day, we might see a, a world where the athletic programs de depart from the actual school. And I mean more specifically, like, you'll have big baller donor step in there, 51% belongs to the school, 49% belongs to this donor, and they sort of separate as their own entity. And it's Ohio State football that is still a part of Ohio State University in terms of those kids going there, but it's like its own thing that's sort of outside of that governance. So that could be something that we see in 2032. We're sort of sort of just swinging at a pinata with a blindfold right now and trying to mm -hmm. guess that, but that's, that's the way that it feels to me. Yeah, I don't think we would have guessed where we are right now six years ago. It's, it's also crazy that 20 year, 2030 is only six years from now too so. is that bob dylan of the times are a change yeah that is bob dylan bob dylan man good stuff well nick appreciate you brother good week man back at it on tuesday back at it then man there it See is you baby then. there it is nick break making it happen hey appreciate y'all dialed in appreciate y'all watching the live show if you're on podcast we love you too subscribe rate review all that good stuff man we're glad to have y'all a part of this this is junkie season now this is where we really got to lock arms and continue to walk through this part of the year that is a little bit less action without the games being played but at the same time there's just as much action with things happening around the sport i promise you locked in right here we'll keep you in the know for all of it we'll walk through it with y'all in all of it we appreciate y'all we love y'all subscribe on your way out we're going to keep this party rolling and we will see y'all 